I'm very excited to welcome our first speaker in this series, uh, Professor Erin uh, Harrison. Um, she is a professor here at the School of Social Work uh, who does a lot of work in this area called uh, legal epi uh, epidemiology, um, which recognizes the important role that law and legal institutions play in shaping uh, things like uh, health outcomes. You are, I think, finishing a uh, book, and it's tentatively titled Hustles and Hurdles, Law's Impact on, uh, is it Desistance? Desistance. Mm -hmm. For job-seeking former prisoners. Mm -hmm. And that's based on uh, 300 interviews of um, drug-involved former prisoners. That's right. right. And so today you'll be sharing uh, some work that may or may not be related with that uh, project, uh, the costs and benefits of an addiction diagnosis. So please give uh, Dr. Harrison a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. As Taiku mentioned, yes, my work, I'm trained in criminology and sociology. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Social Welfare. And I'm very, very interested in the ways in which law and legal institutions and legal institutional personnel um, affect health outcomes. And that's, that's for victims of crimes, that's for those who are accused of crimes, convicted of crimes, as well as personnel working in those spaces. Um, so very sort of broad, big picture idea of how the law, just like any other sort of social structural determinant of health, plays out in ways that um, can be helpful, but unfortunately within criminal justice settings are typically very harmful. So today we're going to talk specifically about the experiences of folks who are drug involved, who have been through the Delaware Department of Correction system, um, and are diagnosed, and we're going to put some pressure on the word diagnosed, um, with an addict status or an addict label for using heroin and opioids in the 90s and 2000s. So I'll start by saying, despite existing in pretty much a, a state of operational crisis, uh, the criminal legal system in the United States exists as it's one of the, it emerges one of the largest dedicated providers of substance use treatment um, for American citizens. And the majority of this population is also navigating an acutely marginalized socioeconomic status um, where intersectional and economical disadvantage exacerbates essentially um, their custodial and post-prison reentry experiences. So this is, this is the setting that's rife for all kinds of problems for this, for this population. Um, second, as, as state prison facilities are increasingly relying upon uh, federal aid, particularly Medicaid, um, for reimbursement support, there are some that argue, me among them, um, that treatment that begets treatment that begets treatment that begets treatment might actually be a lucrative enterprise in these spaces. Um, so I'm very curious about the extent to which treatment doesn't work and whether or not that's actually a failing within a carceral setting, and that's something I want to take on. And finally, related to that, I'm not, I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea that um, recidivism and, and relapse um, and recurring contact with the criminal justice system at large um, are actually challenges that, that are faced by the system. I think, I think it's working the way it's supposed to if you buy into what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, so instead, I argue that these failings um, are a necessary feature of this system, right? That, that it may not be the, the overall objective to get people well and to get people clean in ways that are sustainable and ways that are lasting. Um, and I want to talk about um, marginalized folks in particular, the cynicism that they direct towards these spaces as a result of coming through programs that they believe, and, and I would argue for good reason, are not really set up to help them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So what you're looking at here is an encounter group, which is um, a major, major feature of the therapeutic community, which is pretty much the, the gold standard for drug treatment inside prison settings, both in, in prisons, in jails, and in community-based supervised situations. And the, the TC, the therapeutic community, inside prisons is meant to serve as, as a total environment. So instead of being in general population with everybody else, you live in a different block or a different ward or a different pod, depending on the architecture of the facility. 
Um, all your work assignments are there, you sleep there, you eat there, and you have um, these kinds of programming, these group-based mutual aid sort of efforts um, where you're in this group. It's like a retreat, if you can call it that, um, amongst amongst folks who are, are labeled as drug involved. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you're drug addicted and drug using. You can come in here off of felony possession charges as well. So you're... you're not mandated, but highly, highly incentivized to join a therapeutic community. Um, you can earn good time, good time, excuse me, depending on the state that you're in. If you're coming up uh, for a parole hearing, this could look good as far as an effort to do well and to go straight. Um, so folks who are incarcerated are highly incentivized to join these groups. And, and this is what an encounter group looks like, which is going to be the focus of my talk today. So two things are happening in this space. Typically, so it starts like this with group counseling, and and I'll and I'll also add, not everyone who is a counselor here is actually a licensed clinician. There are some folks who serve as counselors in this space and lead these circles who are actually alumna of the TC program, who are alumna of the Encounter Group experience. Um, so just note that. But so you can see the plain clothes. I think they're women over here on the left and the right would be helping to facilitate this group. Um, they may be LCSWs, it could be a number of different hats that they wear, um, often volunteers from the community, we'll talk about that too. Um, but you start here where we're working on issues of coping, issues of stress, issues of defining and identifying problems and how to respond to them, issues of personal responsibility, um, focusing a lot of attention on anger management and troubleshooting through issues and, and who you rely on or who you tap to help work through those problems, et cetera, et cetera. So sort of on, on at face value, it, this sort of mutual aid, mutual support mechanism, it sounds really positive, except for this drug-involved group, the emphasis is really on personal responsibility and the extent to which you as a person are ill or you as a person are incomplete or unwell or broken. Um, and your drug addiction is essentially a symptom of that, of that identity. So typically you start like this. These groups last anywhere from 45 minutes to three hours, depending on sort of the stage that you're at in counseling and programming. And what happens often, I couldn't find a picture of this without revealing who was in my study. Um, there's what's called the hot seat, and it's exactly what it sounds like, where you sit in the center. Um, some of the men and women I spoke to talk about, uh, or they refer to what's called a, a pinball machine. So if you can imagine sort of in an arcade, a pinball popping off of people, what happens is you're sitting in the center um, and you have essentially insults, um, curses, allegations, all kinds of things, bless you, lanced at you from all around this encounter group circle. And you have to get to the point demonstrably, performatively of, of like sufficiently capitulating. And that usually is manifest in tears, some sort of breakdown, um, some sort of surrender that's, that is, um, like I said, demonstrable enough for you show, like, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm broken. And this, this happens over weeks and months. Like most folks come in much more stoic um, and either are broken down in these spaces, um, accept that addict lab label, excuse me, that addict status, that I'm diseased, I'm less than identity, or they don't and they fake it. And we're gonna talk about the extent to which race moderates the likelihood that they, they go in one way or another after having participated in this kind of encounter group TC program setting. And the way I'm doing this, um, or my analysis rather is grounded in two theoretical frameworks, right? So the first is critical race, which is a theoretical tradition that, that an interdisciplinary framework that leverages that social institutions are racially hierarchical. And I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with this idea. And in my work, I look specifically at the way the criminal legal system does or doesn't operate um, in equitable ways, right? And, and my argument is instead that it's leveraging and sustaining the durability of a white supremacist agenda with respect to othering, with respect to um, subjects who are legally demonized or, or legally propped up and preferred. Um, so that's the framework I'm looking in, is that people within these sites doing time in this prison setting and participating in this therapeutic community group, um, there's going to be differences in how those experiences are understood depending on race because they're operating within a system 
that has a legacy of racial hierarchy, specifically one that bolsters white supremacy. So that's my, my argument, sort of my launch pad um, from criminal race theory. And from critical disability studies, which is newer to me in my work, um, I'm really interested in the way in which um, thinkers in this space interrogate um, ideas of ability and normalcy and capacity and capability um, and the extent to which those things are socially constructed, right? Like what, what is health? Um, what sort of goalposts should we aspire to, to be well, to be good, to be doers, to be contributors in society? All these kinds of things are taken on by critical disability studies thinkers. Um, and they look specifically at the ways in which those constructions disproportionately disadvantage poor folks, queer folks, women, folks who are undocumented, folks who are non-English speakers, you name it, sort of the gamut of the margins, the ways in which we construct what it is to be healthy and what it is to be pro-social um, that these folks take up in these spaces. So just as, as racial hierarchies exist in the criminal legal system, I argue that they also exist within drug treatment, substance use disorder program spaces. And when you compound the two, a highly supervised uh, population in a carceral context that I believe relies on illness to fund itself through some means, um, the, the Medicaid and, and uh, federal funding mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then you have this group of folks who are basically a, a, a despised population. Um, that, that setting is incredibly fertile for, for the kinds of injustices that the men and women I spoke to will shed some light on in a few slides. So this is my data. Um, this was a long five years <laughs> worth of work that I'm still mining. Um, this is a National Institute of Justice funded study called Roads Diverge, uh, Long-Term Patterns of Relapse and Recidivism and Desistance for a Cohort of Drug-Involved Defenders, excuse me. Um, and I worked on this study, which was a two-phase endeavor. The first was to basically collect 30 years worth of arrest and incarceration data for a sample of about 1,250 men and women who had all gone through Delaware DOC, that's the Department of Corrections, um, and we had official um, corrections data on them from 1990 to 2008. The second phase of that study um, featured a subsample of interviews from that 1,250 men and women where they came into the office between 2010, 2011, a little bit of 2012, to talk about their experiences cycling in and out of Delaware DOC as well as the neighboring states. So to give you a flavor of what the population looks like, um, these are the trajectories, the arrest trajectories from which um, I drew the subsample of folks who were going to be interviewed. And what you're looking at here is, is the mean number of arrests on the y-axis, ranging from zero to three and a half, and then the duration of time in which they were observed or followed, and that's 1990 to 2008. And you'll see three distinct desisting groups. What I call desisting are trajectories of folks who, at the end of the observation period, had an average of less than half of an arrest, you know, whatever that means for my math folks in the room, but like fewer than 0.5 <laughs> arrests um, on an annual basis between 1990 and 2008. And then purse sisters are folks who, at the end of the observation period, still were showing a mean number of arrests, one and a half every year. Um, and I use these words persisting and desisting on purpose. I'm not in love with the idea of recidivism, which is an official capture. It's a measure of, of criminal justice contact either. Um, depending on who you ask, it can be a, pr a probation violation. It can be a rearrest or a reincarceration. I'm much more interested in desistance, which for one is not as concrete as do you or don't you have contact with CJ. Um, but gets at process and gets at um, folks' own constructions of harm reduction or identity transformation or the extent to which they're moving from sort of one space or one pattern or one kind of social network to another um, that is allegedly more pro-social. So we're going to focus on how substance use disorder programming affects desistance and the constructions that the men and women in these spaces have about their own desistance trajectories. But before I, I did so, I wanted to just give you a, a flavor of what the full sample of folks look like as they're all included in the study that I'm going to talk about. So that subsample um, of 300 men and women who I told you came back to the office to speak with us in 2010, 11, and 12, 
They sat for interviews that ranged anywhere from about 45 minutes. I think the longest one was seven hours. We had to take them to eat. <laughs> um, that was fun to transcribe. Um, but for the most part, about 90 minutes semi-structured interviews were, I used event history calendars, like, so 9-11, where were you, you know, or when you got your first car, like, where were you, your kid's birthday, where were you, to try and go back in time to see where folks were at um, when thinking about sort of their, their life history and the extent to which trauma, substance abuse, violence, CJ supervision shapes their outcomes or shapes their identity constructions, if not both. Um, all of those interviews were um, transcribed verbatim, imported into an in vivo software package that I use. And what I do with that is it allows me to systematically code um, across demographics, but also around the narratives themselves to look at emergent themes within the stories and see where patterns and overlaps may or may not exist. And so for this particular study that I'm sharing with you today, I'm looking at the treatment experiences of heroin and opioid drug users in this sample of 300 folks who were interviewed. What do they have to say about the experience of being in TC inside of these prison facilities, as well as participating in the post um, SUD treatment programming that was offered to them, which they'll talk about uh, once they got out of prison. Okay? All right. We're cruising. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I want to talk to you about what, what I found, um, which shouldn't surprise you too much that, that drug rehabilitation clients are often characterized as pathologically inferior um, and dependent, and this, this does not situate them very kindly or very attractively in a moment of neoliberalism and social welfare retrenchment and like lots of emphasis on personal responsibility and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, the last thing you want to do is be cast as someone um, who is less than and, and particularly undeserving. So that's that's one of the major things that came out of the themes with talking to the men and women um, that they that they talked about. They believe that people think they're garbage. Someone said um, some of that uh, an administrator, deputy warden looked at them like they wouldn't scrape them off their shoe. That kind of that feeling of just like absolute garbage. Um, in addition to navigating the burdens of an economically constrained reentry context. Um, a lot of racially minoritized drug users also have to reconcile the additional stigma, right, of, of being a black user. And that's what we're going to talk about um, in this space, the idea that, as, as these folks will shed light on, white folks get to be addicts, they get to be sick, they get to be healable, they get to be reparable, whereas black folks are junkies and they're inherently criminal and they're incorrigible. And they believe that that's something um, that's rooted to these disproportionate expectations around personal responsibility that is not imposed upon white drug users in the sample versus those that have to be navigated by black drug users in the sample. And the other main thing that I want to talk about is what black and women in the sample identify both as, as interpersonal um, and a structural reification of white cultural norms within the treatment process, within the recovery process, and how those constructs exist and play out in ways that basically make their buying into this system, their buying into the rhetoric, the language, the identity adoption, it makes that very problematic for them um, in ways that have implications for their own recovery experiences, as well as, unfortunately, the faith that they have, or if they could even muster it, um, for legal institutions and healthcare providing institutions. First, we'll talk about organizational culture and interpersonal exchanges and what folks had to say. So as I discussed earlier, a lot of the ongoing um, carceral TC unfolds in that group-based setting with either one counselor or facilitator or two, um, usually approximately 10 inmates. That was a larger uh, circle that I showed you, but in the sites that I was working in, um, it's about 10 to 15 incarcerated folks at a given time in an encounter group. Um, they feature that highly confrontational interaction, that sort of ping pong or pinball game um, that one of my respondents described. Um, and you're verbally abused and humiliated, essentially, and, until you like sufficiently capitulate and apologize. Um, participants rotate through this ritual, um, and the sessions, everybody said, was very, very troubling. But the extent to which um, 
folks said they wanted to get out of it differed by race and found ways to get out of it that differed by race. So I'm going to give you a, a shared clip with you um, from Karen, who's a 46-year-old black woman um, at the time of the interview, and she was absolutely thrilled to take on a new job assignment while she was inside. Uh, when I say inside, I, I mean in custody, while she was incarcerated, um, because it conflicted with the scheduled encounter group. So the encounter groups are mandatory if you're part of the TC program, you're, you're separated from gen pop, you have to do this. But if you have a work assignment, because of course you will, you will never find a janitor or a landscaper or a mechanic or anything like that in a prison facility, that's all done by the folks who are incarcerated. So if you have a job assignment um, that conflicts with this, it's okay to go. So that's really interesting that treatment is super, super important, but if you have to go mop, we're good with it. So Karen <laughs> left. Um, to do her prison job and she was so thrilled and when she was asked why she preferred the work assignment to TC programming this is what she offered she said I loved it it would get me out of EG that's the encounter group nights um, and EG is when everybody's sitting around in a circle you sit in the middle of that circle and when they call your name you turn to them and they just blow you right out anything they wanted to say cuss at you, you know, anything like that. All you can do is sit up there and you can't do anything. When I got that job, I wasn't in the EG thing anymore. And I'd be so glad that I didn't have to go up and get cussed out, called all kind of names, because I could feel something in me wanting to jump. It was just time for me to leave from the program. I ended up losing weight in there. I lost 19 pounds, got down to, a, this is a size nine she's talking about. Um, came home after that and nobody knew who I was. So Karen went on to talk at length about both both the trauma that she experienced when she was sitting in, in the hot seat in the encounter group, um, but also the experience of bearing witness to, to other folks' degradation, that sort of public shaming exercising uh, exercises, excuse me, as really, really harmful to her own health and well-being, so much so that she lost weight to the point where she said she was unrecognizable. Um, and this is not this solely the experience of a black person. I just chose uh, Karen's narrative to, to illustrate this clip. But to, but to really drive home that um, what's supposed to be uh, a recovery <coughs> exercise, what's supposed to be a mechanism for treatment and healing, allegedly, um, it seems as though these practices affected substantial health declines for at least one of the folks I interviewed. And I can assure you there's, there's scores of others who said, talked about sleeplessness, anxiety, loss of appetite, um, paranoia, all kinds of things. So that's just one example of what the, what the encounter groups do and, and to speak to the organizational culture of them. I'll also tell you that not only did black clients um, report frustration with the rhetoric delivered, that you are sick, you are ill, you are broken, you are less than kind of language, um, not only were they, were, did they problematize that, um, but counselors employed by the company, and mind you, this is a private company, I didn't get into that, but it was, a private company administering um, the treatment, that also aggravated them, their role in this space. Um, rather than operating as, as positive or nurturing role models, some of these counselors and facilitators, um, a lot of the black respondents reported that many of the counselors were, were black and former prisoners themselves who were perceived as like particularly accusatory um, of the, the encounter group members who were incarcerated um, and really demanding that that black incarcerated folks in the group admit to their inferiority. This is this like... Um, this pressure that they perceive came down harder from, from black clowns in the group who were employed by the company. And respondents shared that they suspected that these counselors with their own resolved, unresolved, excuse me, identity matters, clung desperately to sort of this uh, constructed or collective victimhood requiring that all black addicts capitulate, admit to harboring this shared pathos, um, rather than admitting that it might be, their experiences might be a feature of their own individual shortcomings. They suspected that this was, this kind of mechanism was going on. So I'm going to share with you some thoughts from Jason, who at the time of the interview was 42 years old. He's a black man. Um, he's a member of the low level assisting trajectory, if you remember those five groups. So this is, this is like the 0.2 mean arrests per year. Um, and he revealed not only that the TC program was, was pretty hastily put together, um, and prematurely implemented, but that the counselors were very, very poorly trained. Um, they're not equipped to provide diagnosis. They weren't equipped to provide um, clinical support. No sort of like evidence-based best practices were being used in that space. Um, and as a result, he was particularly resistant to what they had to say. So this is what he said. Well, looking back on it, 
I think they were trying to get the program started and then expand it into different areas of the system. I think the best way that they, talking about they is the prison administration, could deal with being granted to start that process from the governor um, was to take the path of least resistance as far as getting us guys to help out. Because I don't really think the key, that's the prison-based TC programming um, segment, six months before they paroled me to work, I'm sorry, I messed this up. Because I don't really think I was in the key um, six months before they paroled me to the work release thing just so I could help build the Crest community. So that's the community-based aftercare. There's the prison-based TC, that's key, and then Crest is the community-based aftercare program. And mm -hmm. and what he's talking about is that he was like rushed out to be a part of this counselor setting um, that he wasn't prepared for. Um, and what he says is it was guys that had already been in the key from July of 88 and then here it was, 1990, and they're still getting smacked down. And by smacked down, he's referring to insufficiently healed and still subjected to the encounter group degradation practices. And they were still dealing with issues. And I really didn't get an opportunity to deal with my own core issues. And that's the stuff that keeps people sick and suffering. Everybody was learning how to identify with and deal with issues. But they was trying to get us to get other people to do it before we did it ourselves. So what he's talking about in part is some of these tensions of, of double consciousness, if you will, and having to wear these two hats as a recovering addict himself, but also now a counselor who's facilitating these conversations, these discussions within the TC um, encounter groups. But also, um, he's what he's describing is a, is a palpable discomfort with with making incarcerated folks in these spaces comply with this language and comply with this rhetoric. Because he had himself and the other guys from 1988 onwards, um, they still weren't healed by, by any measure of the program's metric. And so the irony of being paroled to do the work release, to participate in Crest and facilitate these programs as a counselor um, wasn't lost on him because he himself was dealing with a number of issues um, related to his substance use disorder, as were the other counselors. So he just talks about this idea of within these exchanges, he wasn't really equipped to do so, um, and that wasn't an uncommon issue, apparently. I'll give you one more example um, of how things are happening at the, at the sort of the micro level and culturally within this space. Um, the majority of black clients uh, seldom reported ever being afforded a space um, in which they could enjoy any sort of measure of safety, any sort of measure of catharsis with a counselor or, or with other encounter group and TC community members. Um, so consequently, they pretty much altogether avoided cultivating any kind of meaningful relationships in that space. If you remember what that the encounter group looks like, like you don't want to be in the hot seat, you don't want to be vulnerable, you don't want to say something about yourself, your family, your community that can then be used against you because these are also spaces that are fraught with really, really tight and sometimes very dangerous power dynamics. So a lot of folks wanted to make sure they maintained a distance between themselves, their past, their experiences, and other TC community members, including their counselors. Um, so as a result, they didn't believe that folks in this space were really working to bolster their recovery experiences. Rather, they thought they were trying to undermine it. So Linda, who's a 40-year-old, 41-year-old, excuse me, black woman at the time of the interview, expressed a really, really deep concern um, and desire to develop that trust. But ultimately, she shared that her effort to cultivate a personal connection with others in the TC uh, proved unsuccessful. So the interviewer asked her, like, what specifically about this experience didn't you like, right? What didn't you think was useful? Because earlier she said that it wasn't. And this says, oh no, I love it now. So the interviewer asks, all right, you say you love it, but you said you couldn't find your place before. What was, <clears throat> excuse me, what was problematic about it? And she said, well, for me, the main part of recovery is having a connection with people. So this is something that she experienced in later iterations of SUD programming that she didn't get here. And she says, I really like that part of, of recovery. The problem is that, uh, that I had a problem with this space. This is my business and they don't understand. We're really, you know, they probably do, of course they do, but there's a lot of messed up people out there and I always felt isolated and scared. And she goes on later to talk about um, the desire to experience the unburdening and some of the self-reflection that programming um, ideals, you know, suggested would be available to folks and that other folks, particularly white folks in her cohort, talked about at times, not everyone, I'm not at all pitching that this was a panacea for white people. Um, everybody had problems with this, but she never got that, and her story 
um, was typical of what other black respondents in this space talked about, where I just never had a time where I could completely be vulnerable, where I could do some of the gut work or the gut level work, which is some of the, the language borrowed from that space um, that's required because I just simply never wanted to be vulnerable and I never trusted these folks. Um, so this story is representative of, of the narrative shared by other black men and women in the, simple, in the sample who basically thought the risks associated with being vulnerable, the risks associated with, with playing along and playing into this programming rhetoric um, were just far too great. And a lot of black respondents expressed a desire to get out from underneath the state's gaze like as soon as administratively possible, right? And I say that because aftercare and community-based corrections requires a lot of reporting, requires a lot of touching base, um, it's a lot of paperwork, it's based times depending on the conditions of your probation or parole. There's urinalysis and breathalyzers and phone calls and ankle monitors and all this kind of stuff. So folks are like, I just want to get out. I just want to be done. I want to get out. Right? So continued participation in the, in the CREST program, which is the therapeutic community aftercare. Usually you're in a halfway house or you have to come to a day reporting center pretty regularly. That meant prolonged exposure. So folks were like, I'm not trying to do this. I don't want to be a part of this. Um, and the appeal of prolonging one's treatment for the sake of earning a certificate of completion, um, which are handed out to folks in Delaware who finish all the program, that didn't have the same luster for black folks as it did for white folks in the sample, um, specifically because the idea of, of earning the certificate and showing it to folks, look, I'm better now, um, for black folks in the sample, they said, I don't want to show a landlord or an employer this thing and confirm to them what they already suspected, <laughs> that, that I was a drug user from Wilmington. I, you know, you have this space in your resume. You may have some ink that outs you as far as affiliations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why would I put on paper something, you know, stamped and signed by the governor of Delaware that says, yes, I like am the piece of shit that you thought I was? Um, so folks are like, no, I don't, I don't want at all to ever have a piece of paper like that. Um, which was really different from some of the white folks that I interviewed. So this is a more, this is a more extreme example of, of sort of playing on that system of the added label and the extent to which these certificates can actually be really useful. Um, but it's a true one. <laughs> so I want to share it with you. So this is, this is Jeffrey. He's a graduate of, of the TC program. He did it inside and out. Um, and he talks about how proof of the disease persona is not the worst thing in the world for him, or at least he learned how to leverage it in ways that were beneficial for him. So he was a white attorney. He was disbarred in the state um, for a number of issues that were connected to what was primarily um, alcoholism, but his drug of choice was also um, cocaine. And he made sure to accumulate as many of those rehabilitation certificates as he possibly could. Um, and he was really proud of being able to demonstrate a good faith effort to get clean and really believed in, in sort of the cachet and the clout that that documentation held for him in his reentry um, journey. So he called himself an expert on, on therapeutic communities. And I'll tell you what he describes um, as far as what those certificates did for him. So the Bar Association sent me to rehab. So, so check that, the Bar Association sent him to rehab. Okay, so this is this is this is paid for by them. This is a 28 residential program, um, and I didn't take it very seriously at all. In fact, the opposite. I took it as a joke. I'm like an expert on therapeutic communities. I did the key. That's the that's the prison based program, um, because I'm just a manipulator and I have the abilities to to manipulate. So I was able to manipulate my way through key program twice, get out in six months, and that was the minimum. Went in a third time and pulled a rabbit out of my hat and got out of that early. So those programs didn't work for me. I just get what I need to get. I'm sorry, I get what I need and then get out of Dodge, right? So experiences like Jeffrey's um, underscore the benefits of white privilege um, and class privilege, really, right? So he's no different sort of on paper than, than Karen, who I mentioned before, than Jason. Like, they're all coming through the same program, but the paperwork that he gets after having left Key and Crest, it doesn't come with the foul stain um, that it does for, for black folks in the sample who are like, I would never show that to anybody, right? Instead, he's like, you know, and so that that is an issue that is recurring. He, he's the only attorney that was in our sample. Um, but my suspicion is that this happens more often than not. And there's a lot of research that shows that employers specifically are more likely to hire white job candidates with records than black job candidates without, right? There are all kinds of audit studies, audit studies excuse me, that are quite robust. 
out there that say that. I want to give you, related to this idea of looking for a job, as this is, this is pretty much the most important thing, right? You come out, if you're drug involved, you usually have to do 90 meetings in 90 days, but you definitely got to find a place to live and you definitely have to get a job. So having a record is really, really difficult. Um, and it's sort of posited that these certificates of rehabilitation will be a, a mitigator for any kind of bias that employers have because you're black, because you are CJ involved, and because you're drug addicted or identified as such, um, labeled as such by the state. So Connie talks about how desperate for her unending search for viable employment in Delaware, or Corinne, excuse me, um, she had to lie about her criminal background, basically, right? She said the only way for her to secure work in this space, because mind you too, this is, in Delaware, we're looking at the Rust Belt, so we're coming out of an industrial space, like it used to be GM and DuPont, and now everything is service. Everything is money. It's the banking capital of the United States, like Wilmington, Delaware, is all the credit unions and things like that. Um, you can't work in a bank with a felony drug charge. You can't, you can't clean a window in a bank with a felony drug charge. So it's really, really hard to find a job in this particular service sector labor market. So Corinne talks about basically she had to lie about her criminal background in order to secure work for the only kind of job that vocational programming in prison actually prepared her for, which was her CNA. She got a certified nursing assistant license, but you can't be around a pharmaceutical cabinet you know, with, with this felony drug record. So the irony of sort of job training and vocational training within these spaces also begs some of our attention. Well, what Connie had to say was this. We're told to go out and apply ourselves when we're looking for jobs. So I went there, I'd taken a course while I was in prison for CNA, that's her certified um, nursing assistant certification. She has her CSA, CNA license, and that made me available to them. I got a license as a cardiovascular technician. So referring to application responses about prior felony conviction, she says, you know, they never know. You just write whatever on, on the paper. I mean, in your life, you might be doing right, but you still tell some lies along the way to get what you want, and that's for real, for real. People don't know that, but we do, as, in, as we do this. And as I said, there's a robust body of literature that suggests that for white job candidates, regardless of their backgrounds, they're given the benefit of the doubt in ways that people of color on the job market are not. Um, so for many black candidates in this sample, it's believed that revealing one's addiction history or addiction status or addiction identity or label, however you want to call it, um, it just spells the relinquishment of any sort of meager <laughs> protections they have against bias that exists in the labor market anyways. It's just, that's just a wrap for them, for them to show um, basically that they are confirming that they are what they believe employers suspect them to be anyways. Last one I'll tell you about structural racism and how that plays in um, to the problems that emerge from this kind of drug treatment rhetoric. So additional examples of diminished faith in state institutions um, and their stake in meaningful integration or reintegration, depending on what you think, look like Ronald's, which I'll share with you in a second. Um, he's a 42-year-old black man at the time of the interview. He noted that he believed that these institutional fa failures, excuse me, were intentional, right? These kinds of fearic failures. Um, and in line with, with Jason's telling a couple slides ago about the, the hasty implementation of the Key Crest program, um, what he had to say, Ronald, was that other black peers believed that the TC programming was never actually designed to help black people. Like, yeah, it was hasty and it was kind of shoddy, um, but that that was not an accident, that, that that was quite purposeful, that this program not actually be useful. And this is what he had to say about it specifically, that, that these things were installed to ensure black denigration. He said, I think it was about a particular segment of the government, right, the Department of Corrections, that really don't want to see our particular population succeed. Even though you might have some people in position that are doing the right thing, they really don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And he's talking about advocates for, for prison-based uh, substance use disorder programming. It's like, this is maybe like what they want us to be, useless. Sometimes you get to the point of thinking you're an addict. You know, I know me when I go zero to state in my thought process, and by state he means meaningfully adopting that, that deficit rhetoric, I'm done, right? So the extent to which other black respondents agree with Ronald was not explicitly measured in this study. 
Um, however, when, when operations in correctional spaces that are designed to ready citizens for the world, to be pro-social, to be contributors, um, mimic a lot of the institutional strains that are, that are racially hierarchicalized, if you will, um, and contributed to landing them behind those walls in the first place. Um, when that stuff is going on, arguments like Ronald don't seem unfounded, they don't seem far-fetched. Um, and I actually, in future work, want to look at some of the legal cynicism that might be embedded in this bucking at treatment rhetoric um, that appears racist, I would definitely argue. So it's no surprise that the consumption of this treatment and the adoption of the sick role would vary across racial groups. It's not, it's not netting everybody the same benefits. Um, and in fact, it's incredibly damaging and dangerous for folks who are already coming into these reentry spaces with a really, really stigmatized, marginalized, embodied other identity. Um, and this kind of exclusion and exclusionary social attitudes that, that emerge as a result of coming into these spaces, they extend to other institutional domains and the extent to which folks are comfortable with or will approach or have any kind of faith or trust in personnel and mandates in these other spaces. So this is not just a prison problem, it's a state problem and it's a healthcare problem. Um, and I'll talk about that as we close. It appears overwhelmingly that individual perceptions of the purpose and the utility of prison-based um, therapeutic community rhetoric varies by race. And by varies, I mean white people are digging it in ways that black people are not in this space. Um, a large part of that is because the treatment and the rhetoric and the culture within these spaces mimic larger racial hierarchies that disadvantage people of color, and particularly if they are poor, if they are uneducated, if they are deemed as civically irresponsible, um, and worse, God forbid, if they're addicted to the same drug that we're now having a very compassionate and empathetic response to um, its abuse. So that's, that's another huge issue. Um, one of the major takeaways um, from this study is that multi-marginalized, and I, I would actually argue hyper-marginalized um, people are navigating, is a crisis of diminishing faith in healthcare institutions. So even as Ronald talked about people who are trying to do good, who don't know what's going on behind closed doors, if, if there's um, a mismatch in sort of the programming that's offered and the acceptability and the uptake, you know, all these things that people running clinical trials have to deal with, like why aren't they doing it? Why don't I have adherence? Why do I have all this attrition? Um, it's because this is happening in the background, right? So even folks who are trying to do work that's more equitable and promotes safety and promotes health and well-being across generations, you're dealing with a legacy of mistrust and it's not unfounded and it's not misplaced and that has to be reconciled first. That's one of the huge takeaways that I wanted to give folks um, who are listening to this. And finally, like we wouldn't be running into all these problems, or I think less so, if we were better about incorporating critical race theoretical and critical disability um, traditions in our thinking about health, in our thinking about public health and well-being and safety, um, and the ways in which the law and legal institutions can and do or do not operate in ways that are competent to the way the structures are unfolding, or the larger structures that they mimic, and the larger structures that condition the experiences of the men and women coming through these doors. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, because it's five of, and I've been droning. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. I love your talk. Thank you. so depressing. Uh, <laughs> What's your name first? I'm sorry. I'm Richard Spiegelman. Wonderful and to meet I did a, you. For my dissertation, I did a prison study 40 years ago looking at <coughs> psychoactive drugs. We don't need to go into that. But I have one sort of nitty gritty question before the more critical things. Okay. Come up. You knew you were 300 people. Was that a subset of the 1,044? And was, was were they sampled purposively, or did they represent some? Yeah. So we tried to get a representative sample across the offending trajectory groups because as you can imagine it's much easier to get a hold of folks who are in the lowest level desisting group than it is the persisters group. Um, so to answer you, it's a stratified random sample for the five groups and we got 300. We had to work really, really hard um, for persisters. Um, two of the folks on our team, one had worked in Keycrest and knew a lot of um, POs who had kept tabs on folks who were in the Crest program. Um, the other, just, this is a picture of um, uh, Southbridge um, in Wilmington. This is a neighborhood from which a lot of my guys come from. Um, they had to hit up these spots nonstop, the barbershop, 
the the bowling alley, the check casting station, like all the places where you would find these people, we had to go get them. Um, the sisters were much easier to get a hold of. And, and just like anyone else doing qualitative research with hard to reach populations, if you call and you say, I'm calling mm -hmm. from the University of Delaware because we owe you money, would you call us back? They will call you back. Because these people are part of the study from 1990, right? So, and I absolutely believe in paying respondents. I think it's gross when we don't pay them. So if you if you introduce it that way, you're more likely to get a bite. Your work reminds me a lot of Summers and Carr's work, mm -hmm. where she looks at sort of the construction of denial in a relationship versus who owns denial. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speculate a little bit, because I can imagine people who defend the kind of approach that you're describing as the violence of surgery. Right? Sure. It's an incredibly violent procedure that is somehow necessary. Um, you know, that uh, this is what the person carries with them. They carry denial. To disabuse them of denial is what this therapeutic community is. And their complaints are the complaints of someone who's having surgery without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Or say someone who's been compromised in certain ways that is receiving surgery where it's counterindicated versus someone who is totally healthy and will receive surgery. Mm -hmm. So the white person versus the black person. Sure. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, one way, a perverse way to read your talk is to say, obviously we need to take into account racial differences in these treatments, right? We're going to have the black group and the white group. Um, and I think that your inclusion of the um, abusiveness within which black counselors and black groups um, mitigates that in your analysis, but I'm wondering how equitable spaces can be created inside of a cage. That's um, a great question. I am 110% an abolitionist and I just want to get rid mm -hmm. of the cage, but insofar as I have to operate within this space, that that's the reading of this work should not be how can we make this fairer, The the because I'm not interested in that. I don't like the cage. Mm -hmm. What I'm arguing is that everyone coming out of the cage is not as bad off <laughs> as everyone else. Like there, there are disparities in, in sort of the experience and also to this idea of the violence of surgery that it hurts, you know, um, for everybody. And that's why everyone is, is miserable and complaining. But you would argue, I would hope that someone's going through a surgical procedure so that they can be better on the other side. On the other side of this, they're not necessarily better. They're not healed, they're not recovered, they're not actually dealing with the sort of root causes of their addiction and substance use disorder behaviors and patterns. Um, and then the, the sort of label, the certificate that they get afterwards doesn't net them anything. And not only doesn't it net them anything, it leaves them worse off. So the, the, the analogy I think that you provide is important for us to think about this violence of surgery, but like it'd be different if like you came out of surgery and you had a scar, but you had a new kidney. Now you come out of a the surgery with a scar, and you're still on dialysis, if not worse. So it's like, what what is the point? And and so that that's more so the takeaway that I'd want as far as a reading of, of these findings goes. Sure. Yeah, Bree. Hi. Um, thank you again. This is a great talk. Um, I then have a question about the, the hot seat and sort of like relation to really like a traumatic breakdown mm -hmm. um, of the individual. Did you see the expected response to differ based on gender, or was that a constant across the board? Yeah, so it, it's actually a very, very gendered practice. The encounter group exists um, in men's and women's facilities in Delaware. Um, it started earlier in the women's facilities, and I, I, I think it's important to note that. So this idea of, of the good girl and the bad girl and how those constructions are racialized um, first permeated inside of, of Delaware's women's facility. Um, and as far as the capitulation, it doesn't it doesn't look the same, like the successful or sufficient capitulation. For women, it's tears, for sure. You must cry. You must cry. You must talk about how you've lost your kids, um, how you've only had the worst partners. Um, you know, you ran away from home, and it may have been in some respect your fault. Like maybe you were too troublesome as a teenage girl, this, that, there's that. Um, for the men, um, successful capitulation within those spaces um, is often just to, to stop stop being defiant, to stop challenging the rhetoric. Um, so it doesn't have to be sort of this physical, like brokenness, this puddle on the floor, which is, uh, I think, more of a performance that's required of the women. Um, but you do, you have to stop. You have to stop bucking at it. Um, and then counselors will sort of ease off of you. Okay. Yeah, Denise. Um, was there a relationship between um the experiences you talked about and the outcomes 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's my next thing that I'm doing is, is getting back to my quantitative data analysis, those trajectories. So I, I need to recode these data and map them on. I, I need to first categorize like sort of what the, the narrative is as far as are they clean or aren't. And this is why I was saying I like distance better than recidivism, but it's harder, it's harder to capture because with recidivism, that's a zero one. Did you get rearrested or didn't you? Harm reduction is, is a different sort of variable to capture. So what I want to do ideally um, is to classify who said their experiences were helpful or not, map those on to each subject number, and then bring it back to the arrest trajectory to see if there's any sort of relationship between experiences of SUD treatment programming and then subsequent offending patterns as are picked up by the state. Because we also know those numbers are deflated, right? People, people are doing a lot more than what gets picked up in an arrest. Um, but yes, to answer you, which is why I told Taiku I'm not done with my book. But, <laughs> but yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please, Taiku. So, uh... The folks who are making and maintaining these cages and folks who are paying for the making and maintenance of these cages, um, what's their response to your research? And what parts of your research are most, uh, have the best opportunity to maybe change minds? So I haven't, I haven't presented any of this to uh, an audience beyond the academy. This, this work is published in Social Science and Medicine, but I mean, that's like another beef of mine that our stuff exists <laughs> behind a paywall, you know, and the folks I want to get it to are not going to shell out $40 for it, nor do they want to read academies. Um, so your first question, I cannot answer you just yet. Um, the second thing, what I want them to take away, this is this is a huge issue. My, my whole career, well, the whole 10 years of it so far, I'm 33, but <laughs> my whole career I've been working with stakeholders um, and policymakers really closely, wardens, deputy wardens, DA, um, probation officers, chiefs, and it's really difficult as, as someone who is an abolitionist to have meaningful, productive conversations with folks who are committed to reform. They really, really are. Um, whereas I don't want to fix it. <laughs> I don't want to fix it. I'm on camera. I don't want to fix it, you know. Um, so I don't. I don't want to fix it. Um, so to answer you, as far as like what I want people to think about, I want people to think about why they are so wedded to, to this mechanism. Like why why... Why is this the only sort of reality that you can imagine for social anomalies? Because if, you, if you're thinking like ecologically, like there are always sort of aberrant organisms, you know, like things happen. But when they happen like this at the scale, that's no longer sort of like an offshoot, like a bad, like genetic thing. That's, that's systematic and that is structural. So rather than invest all this time and energy in sort of a, like what to do with this problem, Let's like think big, God forbid, like what could we do about the structural context that gives rise to these populations for whom you believe a cage is needed? You know, so that's that's more the conversation that I want to have with the folks in this space. Because I do believe in that energy. I'm not cynical about the extent to which folks really want to do good. Drug abuse is not funny. You know, this is this is definitely something that we need to tackle. We need to tackle with an open heart and a big imagination. But I don't believe that the cages are the answer. So I just push people like, which is not fun to say to a warden, like, well, what if you had no job? Like, how awesome would that be? You know what I mean? Like that that tension exists and that's real. And so that's something that I'm, I'm always sort of juggling. Um, but that is what I want them to know. Like, let's think big. Let's all not have a job. If this doesn't happen, I don't have a job either. So I'm right behind you. <laughs> like, I wish I had nothing to talk about. That's what I would like the policymakers to know. I wish I had no op-eds to write. Please. Do you have any I wanted, um, ideas of like what would you dream big, or what, what what would you imagine kind of the solution in the immediate, or um, no, just not necessarily the immediate. Like, what would you imagine would work to kind of fix? <laughs> No. <laughs> I snuck in from the outside and not a part of the academic community. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And get more lunch. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I'm being really honest with you. I don't know. And I think part part of it too is like I'm so careful. Um because people are starting to listen to me. 
is this like Berkeley? Like it's people excited, you know? So I want, I want to be really careful about what I say. Um, Cause I don't want somebody running with something that's, that's no boy no. So I, I don't, I, one, I don't know, but even if I did, I'm going to be honest and say, I wouldn't tell you right now. Because <laughs> I want, I want all the evidence and everything to back it. I see you, Denise, but Katie was asking first. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's just my friend. <laughs> I can't answer her question. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Please, Katie. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, I love this. Thank you. And I love your use of critical race theory and critical disability studies. It's fascinating. Um, one thing that really struck me was, um, I think it may be the first participant that you quoted talking about surviving by not making personal connections and not allowing any, yeah, not giving any vulnerability. And it made me think of sort of descriptions of what people get by using drugs and as survival in terms of sort of blocking off oh, sure. sources of pain. Um, and it, it, so I, I am excited to learn about, you know, what, what you might find in terms of what people's like coping mechanisms for the trauma of these groups are, and then what outcomes are later on. Um, and I'm also just wondering if there have been any studies like by people who do substance abuse treatment into this, or like any research, or is, is this just like totally made up by uh, the criminal justice system? Like, where, where did it, yeah. Yeah, so wait, I'm blanking on so, your first question. Well, it was more of a, I don't know if you, I think you had said you hadn't done this part of the research, but I'm interested in how people cope. Oh, yes, and yes, then, yes, okay. And then what the outcomes? Yes, okay. Um, so as far as how people cope, unfortunately, a lot of these folks are coming in and out of the system. So, so their baseline is considered having left a Delaware facility between 1990 and 1996. But we're watching them through 2008 and invite them to come and talk to us. So between 1990 and basically now-ish, they've been in and out. And the facilities have updated what they offer. So as far as coping, um, some of the toolkits that, that are constructed within these spaces have gotten better. They're still not perfect. Um, but some cognitive behavioral therapy modalities are a lot less dangerous than the encounter group, for instance. So people are still able to tap into other treatment programs um, and other lessons gleaned from those kinds of spaces to help them cope um, with the trauma of the EG from years right. prior. Yeah. So there's that. There's also community-based um, settings that are a lot, a lot safer. Because the other thing about the encounter group and the therapeutic community, it is a therapeutic community. It's meant to be a wraparound mutual aid sort of hub where you are, you are cut off from everybody else and all the distractions of prison life. But it also means if you do whatever that capitulation exercise is in the middle of the encounter group and then you go back to, to whatever pod, like you don't have any space from those folks with whom you were just completely naked and totally scared and vulnerable. Um, so to the extent that folks are not participating in TC but, all, but still involved in some sort of treatment programming, there are some strides with respect to sort of healthier um, ways of going about offering substance use disorder treatment inside. And to your second question about other research that looks at alternatives, um, yeah, I'm actually I'm involved in a study right now with colleagues at USC looking at the efficacy of a mindfulness-based intervention. Um, and this is for a women's residential treatment facility program. Um, and what I like about mindfulness and, and what I like particularly about using mindfulness as a modality with and form of mindfulness too, like this is actually like practicing yoga, um, practicing mindfulness rather. Um, is that for folks who don't have health insurance or don't have access to a therapist or a clinician, this is a self-sustaining sort of thing that they can do. And what's nice is you don't have to come back. <laughs> you don't have to come back for it. So it's not the money maker or the money generator necessarily that some of these other modalities are. Um, so that's an example of, of some, some of the work that's going on around alternatives to medication-assisted treatment or CBT or anything else that requires a doctor, a healthcare provider, and requires some money. Um, mindfulness is something that's that's self-sustaining. Denise. Yeah, well, um, I have a couple comments. One is that there's been work done in places where 
you know, communities are faced with high levels of drug use, high levels of, you know, criminal criminality associated with them. And there have been these, like, human rights violations. Mexico has these places where relatives drop off their relatives. Oh, problems. yeah. And so this issue of how populations, you know, the, the kind of um, limitation on human rights and the harm that some of these kinds of things saw, uh, you know, some of them create. But communities are often facing, you know, they're facing the results of, you know, what's going on in terms of people stealing, using, mm -hmm. etc., shooting, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's that dilemma. But the other thing is that the TC model is really old. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yes. It's yeah. really Yeah, 1956 or something, I believe it started. Mm -hmm. and, um, Super outdated. And in terms of, like, you know, some of my work has been on community activism around alcohol and drug problems, and those, you know, which is more grassroots, mm -hmm. and the rhetoric is very different. It mm -hmm. really talks about the need to deal with structural racism that creates unemployment, that mm -hmm. creates inequality, mm -hmm. that creates too many liquor stores, that mm -hmm. creates drugs being in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, the, so the, the idea that you know, Delaware, and I don't know nationally how prevalent it is, but that they are adopting a modality that it just seems like it was old 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's still it is, It's right? still there, Very, in 2017, for in sure. 2017, yes. and when, I mean, a lot of communities have adopted a more environmental approach. I mean, you know, understanding the need for treatment, but communities that we need prevention, and we need to we need to change our communities. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's amazing that the criminal justice system would adopt something that's like, you know, from movies in the 1950s or something. Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of my larger argument, too. Like, I don't think it's broken. I'm, I'm very cynical about that. I, I, think, I think this is working the way it's supposed to work, especially as we move into increasingly privatized treatment provision. Um, there's a lot of money behind this. I agree with what Denise was saying. It's kind of it's such a that model is a dinosaur. It's like I mean, even just to have like you know harm reduction or it's just not exactly trauma yeah trauma center care. I'm interested in uh, trauma for uh, trauma interventions for women offenders. Mm -hmm. But um, wow, so yeah. I'm working on that too. I mean, tra trauma is very racialized and very gendered. Um, Carl Hart's doing some really interesting things in Columbia around this. Um, but the, the pathologizing of trauma is not um, evenly distributed, let's say. <laughs> so even even that, I have, some, I have some beef. And I'm learning so much more about this, too, because as I said to you in the beginning, I'm coming from a very different discipline, and now I'm, I'm working with and educating budding social workers, you know, so learning this language and this rhetoric and this vernacular um, and, and seeing... The, the structural leanings and lackings that exist in that education too is like a thing. I'm like, this is, we need to hit this from, from all different angles. Um, so yeah, the, the T word I have some problems with too, but <laughs> I, I appreciate why you were shaking your head. <laughs> Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, Good to see you. I think you said in the beginning that there were folks who found themselves in these groups and sort of on this treatment trajectory um, who were there for arrest related to maybe sale or something and they hadn't necessarily used themselves. Did you see any, did you interview any of those sure. folks and did you see different themes from them than... It's just um, a waste of time. Yeah. Like, this is not for me. Exactly. That's pretty much yeah, okay. So it's not, it's it not that. Different. Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't put them in here because they're not speaking to the experiences racialized. They're just like, why? But it's good time. But that's another, why is an important question, too, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's a numbers <laughs> thing, too. Like, this is another reason or another component of these contracts that exist with, with the, the TC providing um, contracts. They, just like a private prison, you need to have a, a certain number of beds. Thank you. Thank you.